Awesome. Hi, everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulties, as Joe said, but we're really excited that you're here with us today. Um, so hi, my name is Claire Borkter. I'm the communications manager here. And welcome to our 2023 Beyond the Lab seminar with Professor Vince Diaz. We're very excited to hear from him. Um, so that I know some folks might be new to this space and outside of our lab community, so I wanted to take a second and briefly introduce us to where we are. Um, so we are at SAFL, the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, um, and this is an interdisciplinary fluid mechanics research lab and educational facility under the College of Science and Engineering. We are students, faculty, engineers, and scientists who collaborate to solve fluids-related problems involving water and wind. Um, we are located beside the St. Anthony Falls near downtown Minneapolis, and we are on the homelands of the Dakota people. Awam Niamni, which means turbulent water, is the Dakota name for the falls which we bring into this building. Um, and today I am thrilled to introduce Professor, Professor Vince Diaz as our Beyond the Lab seminar speaker. Um, through this series, we at SAFL get the opportunity to learn from experts in other fields and from our Twin Cities community. Um, professor Vince Diaz is a distinguished university teaching professor, chair of the Department of American Indian Studies, and founder and director of the Native Canoe Program at the University of Minnesota. Professor Diaz works at the intersection of American Indian and Pacific Islander canoe culture revitalization, work that involves hands-on canoe building, traditional voyaging practice and ecological knowledge, indigenous critical theory, and digital media production in virtual, augmented, and mixed reality platforms. Um, we're really excited to have you here today with us. Thank you. Hi, you guys. So as you can see, uh, I operate out of a building that's a little smaller than this one. Uh, in fact, it could fit like right over here. Um, I, I work out of a 25-foot container at uh, just behind a boathouse down, down river. And the Native Canoe Program uses um, indigenous watercraft and what I call the craft work of indigenous um, ecological knowledge about water, land, sky, and human uh, relationality. And it's a term I'll come back to. Relationality is a very key thing to the, the engaged research and learning uh, that we do. <clears throat> um, I've been doing work around the canoe revitalization in the Micronesian region where I'm from, and I'll talk a little bit about that region, for almost 30 years. We've been building canoes, and uh, um, some of you might know of the story of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, Hokulea. Uh, if you don't know that, I'm sure you saw Disney's Moana. <laughs> uh, that represents uh, a remarkable seafaring tradition and culture finally going pop culture and uh, uh, Disney, Disney fight. I have very mixed emotions about that. And this is a culture outrigger sailing and long distance voyaging that's been, uh, that's been going on for about four to 6,000 years now from Island Southeast Asia that spanned uh, to, um, to cover and populate habitable places in all the islands in, the, in Oceania. And there's strong evidence that um, islanders have reached the Americas about the, the same time as uh, the Vikings. Uh, and uh, in a while, I'll also show that uh, this was just coverage of the Pacific o Oceanic region. We also went the opposite direction uh, across the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and so you'll have pockets of what's called Austronesian language speakers all of the Pacific Island uh, languages are Austro belong to the Austronesian-based uh, mother language uh, that you'll also find across islands Southeast Asia. But uh, indigenous languages of Madagascar, for example, are Austronesian. And you'll have pockets of dialects in, in Africa, uh, coastal Af East Africa, and also uh, in South Asia. Austronesian language speakers were outrigger canoe building and sailing people. And I should actually say are because the, the tradition continues. And it's in some of the smallest atolls in Micronesia that the, the practice of building ocean-going voyaging vessels 
and the ability to sail long distances uh, using uh, waves, clouds, stars, uh, pretty extensive knowledge of the maritime environment, uh, continued unabated. And it's from these smallest islands where there has been a remarkable re re revitalization of canoe culture um, in across most of the Pacific, beginning in the 1970s. Um, and that brings us to Minnesota, Minnesota Makoche. I'm sure all of you have seen this map. This is one of the most uh, common maps that we see of the, the, this area here. And um, the reason, the, the, the main thing that I wanna talk about here is what, what we might call the analytic and the social and the political payout of what happens when a seafaring tradition from Oceania that covered that large swath uh, of terrain uh, for millennia meets with indigenous water uh, revitalization in the Midwest. I'm gonna restrict most of my, my uh, material to relations with Dakota people. Um, uh, not to say we don't have relations with Ojibwe people, but uh, for one reason or another, we've moved uh, a little further ahead with Dakota. Um, just a couple of uh, my key interlocutors uh, for the canoe program, uh, Jim Rock and Roxanne Gold. Jim uh, ran the planetarium at Duluth for many years. Ojibwe, uh, I mean, Dakota, astronomer and cultural practice uh, practitioner. My colleagues in Dakota and Ojibwe language uh, in American Indian studies, a, uh, a Dakota historian, Waziatawin, and a land back food sovereignty program called the Makoche Ikikichupi uh, in, um, in uh, Granite Falls, 19 acres of, of, uh, of uh, land back recovery. The lower Phelan Creek folks that are uh, building down there. Um, there's an annual water summit that uh, the LaPointe family um, convenes called the Miniki Wakan. Um, and then uh, Marlena Miles's uh, map. If you're not familiar with some of these materials, I really urge you to take a look at it, the Bedote memory map. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna get into it, but uh, there's tons of stuff there. Oral histories, uh, Dakota discourses about water, land and sky. Um, Awamni, of course, you know, the, this, this material, this, this location here. And, and, let me, and uh, so these are, really important interlocutors, both individuals, but also the place. And you're gonna see that uh, for a lot of us in the Pacific and as a very really important component of our project is to understand and to rebuild relations with the Mississippi River as not just a site, certainly not just a river, but as kin, as a relative. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So. The Native Canoe Program, we've been uh, doing a number of projects since I got here in 2015. And I'll, I'll direct you to um, a couple of uh, um, materials that you can, you can kind of uh, uh, look at on your own. If you're not familiar with Open Rivers, it's uh, an online uh, journal published here at the university. That was, uh, Open River also tries to get indigenous perspectives and, and knowledge about the water. And we had a special issue uh, in fall 2020 on relationality. And when I talk, we talk about relationalities, indigenous relationalities has emerged in the last two decades as a really important analytic. And an analytic that, uh, uh, is one of the best ways for us to take stock of what 
what the indigenous experience, political, cultural, literary, interdisciplinary um, is about. Um, the relationalities we're talking about are relations of kinship and relations of reciprocity between uh, uh, humans, the animate and the inanimate worlds. I really should drop the inanimate. And for most indigenous peoples, there really isn't a hard distinction between uh, animate and inanimate. Um, these relations of kinship and reciprocal caregiving and mutual obligations also exist between land, water, and sky as ancestors themselves. Um, and so between those and uh, the human world and the other than human world, sky father, for, exa for example. Um, and one of the biggest and most important uh, things that has sort of elevated the field of native studies from a kind of caricatured field that comes out of the political movements for decolonization and sovereignty of the 1970s, uh, which it still is, but, but recognized for its sort of intellectual and analytic payout beyond the field has been how uh, in the notions of relation, in relationalities uh, um, bid us to rethink what, how we understand what it means to be a human uh, and, and how to understand nature, environment, technology, science, et cetera, anew in relation to that. So one of the things you find across indigenous uh, uh, systems of uh, cultural, philosophical knowledge systems is that it's actually in the process of making good on your relations of kinship and obligation uh, with the world that defines what it means to be a human. Um, we see this actually when Dakota folks uh, come up and greet us and uh, the amount of uh, emphasis they put on good relations. I greet you, my relative. Um, that's not just a figure of speech. It's in being a good relative, even to settler colonizers, <laughs> begrudgingly <laughs> still. Yeah, okay, you're my relative. I wish you'd behave, but you're still my relative, you know. But it's in being in, in making good in the in the in the obligations and responsibilities of kinship relations and the reciprocity that defines what it means to be a Dakota person. And in almost all indigenous languages, the term that people use to signify to refer to themselves, uh, Chamorro from the Marianas, where I'm from, Tautautano, uh, the people of the land. Uh, my mother's relatives are Rematao, the people of the sea. Uh, we are, the, those terms, Tautautanu, Rematao, they mean the people. It's not unlike Anishinaabe, the people, the real people. Um, it's, what it, it's the category of human, humanness. And so I think one of the things that... Uh, Native studies has, has, has put on a table that has given, that has positioned Native studies in environmental humanities, for example, in, in, um, in that part of STEM research that's increasingly looking at uh, what's called traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, and can work its way very quickly to really radically different ideas about what it means to be a human. In, in relations of kinship with that thing, that enlightenment thinking called nature or the environment. Uh, this has been extremely productive and generative and it's been uh, for us in the field, but it's also been certainly for myself. So um, We had an article, we had a grant challenge grant that, uh, that centered uh, exploring no new knowledge practices between the sciences and the humanities by way of collaborating with a collaborative between Pacific Islanders and uh, Dakota people around canoe building and learning about knowledge of stars, waters, clouds, et cetera. 
And so uh, that collaborative has all been especially uh, generative. And this special issue um, featured a story of uh, when President Gable first came to the university and um, uh, we had a big, we were part of, we were selected to be part of the inaugural celebration. And we had a day at the river where uh, our project that brought Pacific Islanders, um, Dakota people, uh, with uh, computer engineers around virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, advanced visualization, and traditional uh, indigenous watercraft technology and knowledge systems. Um, we partnered with uh, the, the, the team that got the Grand Challenge Award before that. It was a Manuman project. Uh, of folks at CFANS and a couple and um, the Earth Sciences uh, working with Ojibwe folks. So there's a little article there and a photo essay that at to that point in 19 in 2019 uh, will give you a sense of uh, a sort of feel for a lot of the projects that started to come together and flower at that time. Um, Uh, indigenous relationalities as, an, uh, as alternative epistemologies and ontologies. Ontologies is just a fancy philosophical word for subject, subject, uh, subjectivity. Uh, not quite identity, but the uh, the category of humanness and axiologies, the, the things we do. Uh, these are alternative epistemologies to and and ways of thinking about oneself and, and ways and doing things that are in stark contrast to settler colonial relations uh, and logics of selfhood that are often defined in terms of private and state pro ownership of property, uh, individual possessiveness, uh, that idea of man's dominion over uh, the cosmos or nature's resources. This is decidedly not the romanticized Na na native is one with nature, crap. <laughs> I just want to say that, okay? This is not the romanticized, mythologized, uh, uh, crying native over a polluted river kind of thing of the 1970s. As an analytic and a conceptual workhorse for indigeneity, uh, indigeneity is another analytic. Uh, it, it, it also uh, stresses deep relations with indigenous communities as a condition for doing academic work. Our department, all of us, uh, all of our work is steeped in, in our communities. Another um, uh, resource that I wanted to call your attention to other than those, that special issue. Uh, this will give you more coverage than I have time for uh, to give you a sense of the program. Basically, I wanna show you a couple of videos and a couple of really cool images. So I just want to get some of the sort of backdrop, backdrop uh, uh, things that are at work here. Uh, there is a, uh, an exhibit at Northrop at the fourth floor called the Y Canoes. Uh, and that one features objects, artifacts, processes, things from the last couple of years that is still up in display. Uh, and uh, and um, in many ways, the, the lead research project for the Native Canoe pro Program is premised on, on the question, on answering the question, why canoes anyway? Um, most of us think of canoes for recreational purposes, et cetera, that kind of stuff. For, for us, especially in the Pacific, canoes are not simply those kinds of uh, things. So um, in, in over 50 years of uh, canoe revitalization across the Pacific and increasingly in Turtle Island, especially in the Great Lakes area, but also in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where indigenous people really identify themselves as a water people. And this is the case in the, in the, in the, in the Great Lakes as well. When I moved to the University of Michigan uh, 25 years ago, I, was, I taught there for about 12 years. I wasn't at all 
uh, prepared to, to uh, encounter a very, very robust discourse of Ojibwe people understanding themselves to be a water people. And Michigan uh, booster, state boosterism, uh, liking to describe the state as the nation's third coast, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it was wonderful. I started to meet people who were at the forefront of building canoes, uh, in this case, birch bark, uh, rigwash jimon. Uh, and in almost every case, the stakes, the purposes for, for canoe revitalization was basically the same things we see across the Pacific for cultural pride, for cultural, spiritual well-being and competence, life and death, for language revival, huge in native communities, environmental stewardship, caregiving, reciprocal relations, political activism, political leadership, economic survival and flourish in some of the Pacific islands. There's a return to sail technology as an alternative technology to shipping and very, very sophisticated uh, watercraft. Uh, nation building, and I add academic inquiry, building canoes for engaged research uh, and learning. Um, why canoes? Canoes are capacious. They're, they have tremendous carrying capacity. Uh, they perform well and they can cover a lot of ground. And I'm not just speaking metaphorically here. We can also understand this in quite literal ways. Uh, canoes are great for building good relations, for teaching and learning, which have done well, can also become great vessels in and off themselves. Um, what snags all the students and all the people who, who come through our program is a very, very simple and elegant thing. Canoes get us back out into water. And when we get back out into water, we start learning uh, and appreciating it and beginning to think of ourselves in a very different way. What's key here is, is, comp is supporting this with, with research, with literature, with substantive material about canoe culture. And so we put it a little more poetically in, in the art exhibit. And this was done by graduate students uh, who began as undergraduate students. I have a class on ind indigenous environmentalism that's also known as the canoe class. And every fall we meet Saturdays that yeah, people give up their football Saturday. Uh, and we basically meet down at the river and go out or we, we'd go out to the communities and paddle. Uh, why canoes? Uh, the subtitle of the project is uh, Capacious Vessels, Indigenous Futures of Minnesota's Peoples and Places. But why canoes? Because they're beautiful, functional, fun to use. They're feats of advanced hydro engineering because they're sacred. Um, I'm really mindful of this one uh, here. <laughs> uh, that, that's your gig, you know, but I'm gonna make that claim. We need to do more research to just actually quite demonstrate what's remarkable about them as, as engineering feats. Because, they're, but they're also sacred uh, because they can move us and teach us how to balance properly, quite literally. You know what happens really quickly if you're not balanced in a canoe. Uh, because they link us to land, water, and air, past, present, and future. Uh, because we need to move differently. Because we need to move together properly. Because we have so much to learn and they have so much to teach. Um, President was a real sport. She didn't want to get on the canoe. This is my 20 foot outrigger sailing canoe. It's actually a sailing canoe. We have a, uh, but it's hard to put the sail up in the river because the outrigger, the pontoon float off on one side, that's the signature technology. For longer distance voyaging, that outrigger would be replaced with a second hull and then connected with a platform then it can grow. So we have canoes that are 70, 80 feet double hull that can carry 40, 50 people and be out in the ocean for months at a time. Um, and for warfare, you'd connect maybe 30 or 40 of those together. And now you have a huge floating island. 
with smaller attack canoes on the margins and then and all you have to do is wake up one morning and look out in the horizon and if you can't if all you see is just these fleets this big fleet of war canoes you're going to settle for peace really quickly I want to pause here for a second real quick, um, and then I'll go to the videos. This is Oceania as we know it, and not even covering the northern part. California's up there, right? This is the more familiar Polynesian Triangle that most of you are aware of. The Maoris from New Zealand, Hawaiians, in Easter, Easter Island over here, uh, French Polynesia, Marquesas, Tahiti, over here, you have Samoa and Tonga and parts of Fiji. Most people know Polynesia as the Pacific, but the fact is like 80% of the population of the Pacific is from Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands. And then probably the best part of the Pacific is Micronesia up here. Those dots, that's where I'm from. Polynesian, Melanesian, my, my, uh, Micronesians are Austronesian language speakers. So our languages are all very similar. Those languages came out of Island Southeast Asia about four to 6,000 years ago with the development of outrigger technology and the ability to sail long distances. Uh, really different kind of cartography, um, different understanding of relationship with time and space. We're able to uh, figure out how far, how fast you traveled out in the open ocean with remarkable precision, long before there was latitude, longitude, before there was a sextant, before uh, compasses, time, phenomenons. Um, the Austronesian seafarers spread out across and populate all the habitable islands, uh, but then move in this direction. So the lines are the coincidence between outrigger technology uh, and uh, Austronesian languages. Do you see the pockets? So you might know that the Pacific Ocean region is, you can combine all the areas, all the land masses and all the other bodies of water. And the Pacific Ocean region is still larger than that. So it's a big world. Uh, five hours from California to Hawaii, another nine hours from Hawaii to Guam. From Palau and the App and the Marianas to the Marshall Islands just here is bigger than the continental United States. Just add alone Kiribati, the Republic of the Gilbert Islands, and that's almost the, the size of the continental United States. Micronesia alone, it's almost double the size of the continental United States. We were traveling a big swath of the earth for thousands of years. It's in the smallest atolls in the Micronesian region where the canoe, uh, the technology of, of open long distance voyaging uh, capabilities continued unabated through 500 years of uh, Western and Asian colonialism through four colonial administrations, Japan, Spain, Germany, uh, United States. And that's just the Micronesian region. Wrong screen. I wanna show the first six minutes or so of an episode of uh, Pioneer Public TV, Minnesota Public TV.
We come from a people that have thousands of years of traveling through these kinds of crafts and the ability to sail long distance using knowledge about the environment, stars, waves, clouds. To find Micronesian canoes in the plains of Minnesota shouldn't shock us because we have voyaging and movement in our cultural DNA. My name is Gabriel Elias, and I'm one of the leaders here in uh, our Micronesian community uh, that resides in this area. I live here in town, Mylan, and we built a canoe. <laughs> Mylan is about three hours west of us. About two thirds of that town's population is from this Micronesian island. So I teach here at the University of Minnesota American Indian Studies. I'm from Micronesia, from the island of Guam, and with lineage to some of the other islands. I started to get to know the folks from Milan, brought my canoe, I have an outrigger canoe that I've had with me here, and they wanted to a canoe of their own. And uh, Michael and Gabriel from the community asked me to help them do that. I'm a historian, but I also look at the survival of seafaring traditions in Micronesia. So that work has, has got me working with men from Polowat Atoll. I've been doing work with them for about 30 years. I'm originally from Polowat, one of the island in Chuk State, in the federal state of Micronesia. And I live in Saipan with my family. I'm, I'm a navigator. I was ordained a navigator two or three years ago. Back home, that's what we use. We use canoe, we navigate, you know, like islands to get food, to go and fishing. So that's how, since, you know, like when you, I was small, I started, you know, like going with my father, with my uncles and cousins. And then I helped them carve canoe when I was, you know, like still a young boy. I miss what I've been doing back home. Like when I was young, I used to go swimming on the beach, uh, play with friends, go fishing with my uncles. Life is very, like uh, really free and unique. Uh, over here, it's totally different. It's a different environment, different life. With the help of uh, a couple of grants at the university, we put together the funds to bring Mario and an assistant, Laureano. We also wanted them to do work with folks in the upper and lower Sioux communities to build a Dakota dugout as well, what they call Wata. Dr. Diaz talked about a few things that he's working on and that he wanted to um, be respectful of whose land the Micronesians are on, and traditionally that's Dakota land. Our people use canoes to, to travel, to hunt, to uh, go wild ricing, to do a lot of things, you know, and that was a part of who we are as Dakota. You're going to shape it more, Mario? Yeah, shape it more over here, make it a little bit smoother. And then... So the plan was to have a group of uh, Lower Sioux members, a group of Upper Sioux members, and the Micronesians to work with Mario and his assistant on these different canoes. <laughs> So we have a little one that was made a couple Thanksgivings ago. The dugout that Mario is helping us with. He went to the Montevideo Museum and they have a few dugout canoes there. Um, the one that we have and then other research they did to look at it um, to, to make it close enough, you know? Yeah. size of it, huh? 
Tawata Gahupi. Um, ta, tree, wata, boat. Gahupi uh, means they're like uh, digging it out, they're taking out that inner membrane. Tawata Gahupi, that's, that's how you would say dugout canoe or making a dugout canoe. I myself, I am Lakota, we're more horse people and bull riders. My children are Dakota, and um, it's just really important to know who you are and where you come from and, uh, you know, embrace that. I'd recur, you know, like, there's a big difference because Dakota. <laughs> Sorry about that. Back to the piece again. Huh? Do you want to go back to the piece? Yes. God can do is only one, one hall. God. Yeah. Just uh, some of the coverage of the activities that we've been doing. Uh, How did so many of these Pacific Islanders end up in some town in Western Minnesota? It seems a Peace Corps worker from that town that went to their island. And then the kids that grew up uh, uh, at the house that he stayed in, when he finished, he came back to Milan. Uh, one of the guys now 30 years old came to visit him, brought his wife. And what's, but the real driving force is uh, the Genio Turkey factory is nearby and they needed labor. So, they started recruiting guys and families from their island. I would be really happy to come back and talk about the second part, which is the the virtual reality stuff. I haven't, I don't have time to talk about that. And that takes it to a whole new level, to a whole new world, but. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of substance to uh, what we might call Dakota and uh, Micronesian relationalities. Uh, and two things that uh, um, really capture this. In Dakota theology and cosmology, the idea of the Kapemni, and many of you will have seen these icons in in artwork and, and in uh, beadwork. Uh, people would often mistake it for a cross, but it's not a cross. Missionaries would appropriate it, appropriate it for a cross. The, cap the Kapemni basically means that everything's that one finds above in the sky world, all the way up to the stars. Also, uh, the cosmos is already spoken for. It's already on this plane below, in the social world, in the cultural world, in the material world, the world we live in. And everything that one might find that, is, that, that can be known uh, of this world, the past, present, and future, is also already written in the stars. And to, to, be, to make good on Dakota humanness, to be a good Dakota person is to align yourself, align how you conduct yourself with, with um, everything here, with everything there, up here. And so the Kapemni captures that visually and, and theoretically. Uh, and it's actually a plane that's uh, twisted. So you have like a kind of vortex and there's perfect symmetry here, so the, the, the vectors down and the vectors up are, are perfect. This is also the, the key symbolic of the tipi. And this point right here is something of a portal. And so the passage from that world into this world when you're born, and then through that out. It means everything that's above is below and all that is below is above. This is one of the reasons why uh, Dakota would be in one moment talking um, casually in a, maybe a light 
hearted conversation. And then on the drop of a dime, they're talking about the stars or something millennia ago or a thousand years ago or, or 1862 with the, the, the war and the removal. Like it just happened a few seconds ago. In the Marshall Islands, in the meantime, across the continent, <laughs> across, the word for island is ilang. It might sound like English, but it's not a mispronunciation of English. Ilang is composed of two parts. I means currents. And it's currents that begin from the ocean floor and, and uh, underwater currents but it also includes the surface level. So waves and swells. But then above the, the sea level uh, in the form of winds and many different classes of winds, then clouds, then the stars and the movements of the heaven, I currents. Lang, if you miss the point, means sky. I lang. Excuse my language, that's our fucking island. Contrast that with uh, the Western idea of an island as a tiny, remote, isolated, uh, you get the point. So you might have heard of the saying, no man is an island, right? It's, uh, it was coined uh, by John Donne to capture this idea that humans are not individuals. They're not atomistic. No man is an island. Yeah, you can excuse the gender, man speaking for all humans, but the, there's also another level of violence there. For us, no island was ever an island to begin with. <laughs> an island is not a marker of tiny, remote. Uh, our islands are actually really expansive. They begin from the ocean floor and they include the stars. Uh, I produced this little piece in conjunction with an augmented piece uh, with our colleagues in, in uh, computer engineering to capture um, what I call canoe relationalities. How canoes as technologies uh, are embodiment of these relations of kinship and reciprocity uh, between uh, humans and objects, humans and non-humans, but also humans and land, water, sky. Because we also talk about land, water, and sky having uh, kinship relations with each other. You cannot, in the island, you cannot talk about land without talking about water. You cannot talk about water without talking about sky. You can't talk about any of those without quick recourse to the others. This one or this one here? These things get more complicated. It's supposed to get easier, but they get more complicated. Look out for a phrase where to know us properly, you need to know how we got here. There's a line that says stars. And how we continue to move through time and space. This is why we still value Balsam. our canoes, because they connect us to how our ancestors sailed over thousands of miles of ocean, going from island to island without compasses. These abilities and more are held in our stories about stars, our oldest relatives. Stars point us to where we want or need to go, and they teach us how to tell time. We can say that stars steer us in our voyage on this canoe called Earth.
Pafu means to look at and count stars. On a pandanus mat, shells are placed in a circle. The shells represent rising and setting points of select stars around an island or a canoe. And these rising and setting points are useful because they point toward meaningful locations around us. Tumur came during leaf and time. No more uh, breadfruit. And people were kind of hungry because they just eat uh, taro from the taro patch, no more breadfruit. It's a famine uh, star, and this is dying for famine. Wound means poison. So the fish are eating something that you should watch out for when you go fishing in the month of Un. At the same time, they said you don't catch a lot of uh, ocean fish in that month of Un. Because even the big uh, fish, they know the smaller fish they eat will be poisonous. So they, they don't waste time going out fishing. Stars are associating with uh, waves and uh, with the current. We were sailing to, from Polowat to Tamadam, and then on our way back, we were then talking stories, but one of the greatest navigator was with us, and he was sleeping. So he was sleeping, and all of a sudden he wake up and said, you're going wrong direction. So what? We're not heading for Bulwad anymore. And just by feeling it, he was sleeping and he feel the way, you know, his body turn around. But even the, uh, you know, the way they uh, hit them, make himself uh, turn around, he knew, he already knew that the direction is not right. In the islands, we have a saying the canoe is the people, and the people is the canoe. How we steer our canoes, for example, sometimes you can't tell where the human body ends and where the ocean and sky begin. So too with the body of our islands, which begin from the ocean floor and are made up of currents and waves, winds and clouds, and extend all the way up to the stars, stars that teach us everything, direction, time, seasons, and how seasons connect us to birds and to fish and to trees, like the breadfruit trees that our canoes are made from. Canoes whose own bodies connect land, water, sky, and people. For the canoe is the people, and the people is the canoe. So I, I really should wrap it up. There's, there's a whole second half where we take Micronesians and Dakota building canoes together. And, and, and um, but that work, the technologies and the stories and the values that go with that, the relationalities that go with that side by side with virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, um engineering to see what happens what kinds of relations can can these prompt 
uh, or uh, or new knowledge practices or new ways of doing lab or new ways of thinking about water uh, uh, identity uh, society the big the big questions um, and I could really spend a long time with that because that work is um, is uh, itself prompting um, new insights into all for all of the, the components. Um, but let me go ahead and just stop there, maybe a few minutes for questions or comments. Oh, just one more thing. The canoe class is every fall and we most of the time we meet at the, down by the boathouse and it's open to the community. You guys wanna come down and hang out uh, without necessarily taking the class, come down. How do you find out about that? You can email me. <laughs> American Indian Studies, I'm the chair, so just look at the website. Um, so Professor Diaz, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know how your relationship to canoes has changed since you were a young person, a little person to now, um, and all this work and all this study. I grew up in the island of Guam, though I'm not native to that place. My my lineage is uh, my father's from the Philippines and my mother's from the island of Pompeii, another Micronesian island. Guam, if you don't know, is, is like Honolulu. It's a U.S. territory. I didn't grow up with these things. We didn't we didn't grow up with the, the tradition. I was a jock. <laughs> I left Guam to play football at the University of Hawaii. It was at the University of Hawaii um, uh, when I learned about the Polynesian Voyaging Society. They sailed, uh, this was in 1979, uh, three years earlier, they sailed from, um, from Honolulu to Tahiti, which is almost 2,500 miles uh, using stars, waves, clouds, um, navigated by a man from our region, Micronesia, and he predicted landfall the, ne the night before. He'd never been to Tahiti <laughs> and, and, and had never been to Hawaii. So this was a game changer for me. Uh, I almost quit school to go back to Guam and then get a get on a boat to go to the smaller atolls to learn. Uh, but I continued school and it was uh, and I did everything I, I could to read read up. So I didn't grow up with this thing, um, but I did have relatives in the outer islands that were canoe builders. But I didn't know about that. So. Uh, like most natives, like the majority of natives, we were severed from traditional practices and values and stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of funny ending up in Minnesota because like uh, as a football player, I was a big fan of the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> I knew more about the Vikings than I did about, uh, about uh, my own lineage and heritage. So so university, I like to tell, tell students is, it's actually like a kind of canoe for me. Uh, getting advanced degrees uh, was was a important vessel for learning about art histories. Um, and I built a career um, learning from canoe revitalization and the survival of the tradition in places like Polowat uh, to sort of customize uh, work in history and anthropology. So it, it's, uh, 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 canoes have been very good to me. Yeah. Well, first, I'm gonna pass you the mic. I don't know how much you know about the lab, but you know we're a relatively traditional science and engineering lab. Can you, can you think of something a project or an area in particular that would make for a good collaboration between, it seems like there's a big gap, gulf between this and this. Yeah, so two things already came up uh, first at the outset when uh, Di Diane, is it Diane? Diana. Yeah, when she presented what uh, the work that she was doing with with her. The first one is, is um, when I first got here and I wanted to know more about the place, what it was called, uh, what were the stories of this place? 
uh, the traditional ecological knowledge is contained in the narratives and the stories. The best I could find was that map that just had, you know, here's Awamni here and then the Kota village. And that's what, you know, so, and we're a pretty star studded department of historians, American Indian historians, not American Indian studies. It's long overdue to do a kind of um, um, indigenous history of this place. Um, and, and through through the the analytics of the language of 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 Kapemni relationalities, um, including how Dakota continued to negotiate their way since 1862. Um, when I brought my canoe, the first thing we did was actually before doing, putting it in the water. Uh, I wanted to bring it to the Bedote because I learned the, about the significance of the Bedote. Some people say that the Bedote, where the Mississippi and Minnesota uh, come together, the confluence, is actually one embodiment of the of that sweet spot of the Kapemni. That that's the portal. That's one spot. Others would say that's only part of a larger portal that goes all the way up to Mille Lacs and Wakan Tipi that kind of stuff, but, but what are the stories of this place up here too and the falls? We, it, we don't have that. So that's one, a kind of native Dakota Ojibwe history of this place. Um, uh, in the scales that Kapemni teach us. The second thing is, uh, Sean raised this when we were down at one of the uh, not the plume, but the the larger where they have the. Is our, our next big project is to um, is to do wave simulations. So waves, stars. There are blind navigators in in, in Micronesia because because uh, swells and waves are associated are related to stars. So if you know your stars and if you, if, if you know your waves and swells, you know your stars. And so you can navigate by feel, literally by how, how your canoe interacts with that swell. That swell has a very distinctive look and feel, and that swell has a very distinctive look and feel. Um, how they come together has a very distinctive look and feel. How they bend around islands you can identify islands by, by the feel of the waves and swells. So um, navigating by waves and swells is one of the, the sort of higher, higher level um, skills that you gotta go out there, but we can really do a service here with virtual reality and simulate that. Uh, we know a couple of navigators who are willing to come here to with their students and help us develop this in a way that, you know, so this might be a place where we could do some of those wave simulations just off the top of my head. But there's also a lot more research to do on the maritime technology of, of indigenous watercrafts. You know, they did that, our director, Ken actually does a lot of modeling of those and very low Let's talk. Was that? We tested paddles. Yeah, that's all kinds of stuff. And 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 then again, when when you realize that, uh, what relationalities does when we to to help us rethink how we think about technologies, the technologies are are they're still tools. They're instrumentalized ways of living in the world. I, I the knowledge of of uh, of the stars uh, is an instrument, right? But it's also not just an instrument. It's also the paddle is also a being. As an embodiment of the relationalities, it's it's also an animate thing, you know. So. It just it just makes for a, a whole 
it's a game changer, I think. And this is old stuff. This is the stuff that's been denigrated as uh, yeah, superstitious. We were talking at lunch. What indigenous relationalities does is it, it, it foregrounds connectivity where we think there's no connection or where, where we couldn't fathom connection, there's connectivity. And that, that connectivity turns out to be probably the most important part to understand what you would otherwise think as the holes. So it's at the edges of the interconnection where you really understand. So I understand the island world now, no longer simply as a small, little land base, but by its networks. And, and uh, one of the ways that you keep time and, 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 and rate to figure out how far you traveled involves a form of triangulation where you're moving an island of origin under a star course relative to an island of destination under its star course relative to a third island. These are said to be moving in their own tracks, such that a successful voyage is almost as if the canoe's stationary and the islands are moving uh, around. Um, but um, connectivity and then flow and mobility, movement, flow, and connectivity. And I think you guys are doing a lot of that kind of work here. Thank you. Um, my question is, what's the background that I has led to losing some of this knowledge that is motivating this revitalization of the canoe? What, what, what is, uh, what's motivating the revitalization? continuing colonialism, <laughs> environmental degradation, uh, inhuman treatment of people. Uh, I'm gonna show you a quote here that uh, takes us to, takes us to a, a direct line to Again, I'm Apeliha Ofa. To remove a people from their ancestral natural surroundings or vice versa, or to destroy the lands with mining, deforestation, bombing, large scale industrial and urban developments, and the like, is to sever them not only from their traditional sources of livelihood, but also much more importantly from their ancestry, their history, their identity, and from their ultimate claim for legitimacy of their existence. This was in an article that he wrote about the need for us to write our own histories and how to write our own histories by focusing on our oral traditions of ecology. He said, we have rich traditions of knowledge, uh, environmental knowledge, uh, a, a beginning with seafaring. So um, this is the story of the last 500 years. It's also a story that the, the canoe we're in, right? It's an unsustainable one. Right? <laughs> we need something different uh, and maybe indigenous relationalities. Uh, in our field, indigenous feminists uh, have a, a fixed radical to indigenous relationalities. Radical re indigenous relationality, radical rel relationalities is all of the above, but with an eye towards structures of power, uh, oppression, colonialism, patriarchy, um, extractive industrialism. So this is some, this is what motivated us. 
Uh, our worlds are disappearing. We don't know our histories anymore, our literal islands. One of the supreme irony here is that the tradition of long distance voyaging and canoe building survived 500 years of this stuff in the smallest atolls. But it's the atolls that are most endangered by rising sea levels now. I mean, if the people who are most knowledgeable about the sea <laughs> can't survive the sea, we're in real trouble. You know, so uh, uh, that's the sort of edge to what we do. You have time for one more? You got it? Hi. I have a Zoom from the chat. It's kind of changing the topic of canoes into the more physical side. It's from Brian Allen, um, and I'm quoting him here. I am interested in the design of kayak and canoe blades. From some of my studies, the blade design used in some paddle blades seems superior to the oval or squarish blades in common use. Have your studies led to anything that might add to this understanding? Um, I don't know the studies. So there's an, I know that like uh, boating, boating folks and sailing folks get really deep into the technology and, and design and the hydrology. And that extends to, to paddle stuff. There's, there's a real kind of cottage industry around paddles, right? I don't know the answer to that. I do, uh, what, what comes to mind is, are the different sort of cultural stories about paddles that, that are, um, that tell you something about paddles that's not the paddles you think. <laughs> uh, paddles that uh, sing, for example, the design, uh, the, the angles and little bulbs that would be carved at the end so that when struck in the water, they'll make a very particular sound. Paddles are also used for calling fish or sharks. Um, paddles are weapons shark points. It's a very famous story of a, 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 in a moment that that star uh, in Aldebaran. So the calendar is marked by rising and setting stars. The star that rises after a new, the, new, the moon cycle is when a new uh, month begins. And uh, the famine month, uh, there's a very famous story of um, going to uninhabited islands to fish because, because the food is scarce in your home island. Uh, and a very powerful navigator. Men I, who I have um, interviewed knew this person and swear that this is, this is real, right? When they got to this island, the, uh, the breadfruit were not bearing fruits. And they knew that it was uh, the famine month. So he planted the paddle. Uh, and then uh, the next morning, there was a breadfruit bearing tree there that turned into that. So a lot of the old knowledge, and this is probably one of the reasons why traditional uh, knowledge uh, has been denigrated by science, recent thinking. How can you take that seriously, right? Things like that. But the, the Dakota, Lakota uh, intellectual Vine Deloria also once observed that the difference between indigenous knowledge systems and science is that where science coax, tries to coax truth out of the phenomenon it observes, right? Indigenous knowledge system seeks friendship with it. Um, and I think that's worth really stopping to think and, and really pursuing that to the hilt. And that looks like another kind of romanticized stereotype, you know. But I think there's a lot of relationalities there. Um, just because something is, can't be seen or observed and I know that I'm 
caricaturing science here, uh, or because it's mysterious. Uh, and science at its best tries to figure out the mysteries that come up with, a, with an explanation. But indigenous knowledge systems also has a kind of famously or notoriously, however you think about it, it doesn't have a hang up with that, you know, where, where it's like when you study the stars, for example, I learned very quickly that there's such a fine line between what we might call astronomy in the traditional system and astrology. It's like a real fine line, you know, at one moment or, or weather forecasting and divination. At one moment, you're on solid ground through millennia of observation. When that star is rising, all these other things are going to start happening. It's an association there, and you can begin to build off that, right? But then, but then it it goes from it goes into uh, goes from weather forecasting to divination. But there isn't a hang up with that. There, this that's like that's not a problem, you know. Uh, and uh, and somewhere in there, that's also there's there's also a radically different relationship with that. That doesn't necessarily come at the expense of having a firm understanding of what you're looking at. But these are really different systems. There's no doubt about it. And there's overlaps. A long way of answering that question about the paddles. Well, thank you so That's, much, Professor Diaz. This has been wonderful. Sorry, did I cut off a final thought? I just want to say, so that question about the technical performance of a paddle uh, isn't, isn't disconnected or put another way, it's connected to the ontological status of that paddle as uh, a miracle worker as well. So let's uh, give a round of applause.